70 WOCA. Ocala. Right, five minutes after ten o'clock. Beautiful Monday. Hope you're doing as well as the as the weather is. It's just really nice out there. Uh, last October, I went back to New York with my son, and uh, as we're walking around the city, he um, I, I was pointing. He's thirty, just so those of you who don't know can know. So he's an adult, in other words. And I'm pointing out, there's old New York. You look up at the top of the buildings, that's old New York. That's the, You can see the old New York still there, right? Yeah. But the one thing that I sort of kind of did, I think, is I went back in time. I was thinking about, so many times while I was there, I was uh, distracted by my own memories. Uh, and... You you know the 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 saying I, I don't know who who said it was it Robert Frost you can't ever go back you can never go back whatever it is um, you can and you can't I think one of the best ways to go back if you ever have a time machine uh, the if you can't get a time machine I should say the best way is to write about your your history because when you're writing about it you're sort of there in your mind right you don't have to be physically there in fact mm -hmm. I'm I'm more there. When I'm writing something that has to do with my past, then when I actually go to where my past took place, uh, Stephen Cousin has uh, we've pa we've crossed paths. <laughs> uh, I I've never met him, I don't think, but we've crossed paths. He was a high school principal for 21 years. He's the education reporter for WCBS News Radio 880 in New York. I used to listen to it all the time. He's a speaker on uh, suicide preventions. He's an adjunct professor at Hofstra. My mom. Taught, not she didn't teach at Hofstra, but my mom worked at Hofstra. Um, a lot of my friends went to Hofstra. He's a weekly columnist for the Herald Chain of Community Newspapers. He's got a lot of credentials, and he's written a book called Five Freshmen, and this is his time machine. It's a story of the 60s, inspired by his own years at Cornell University, which is, for those who don't know, upstate New York, near uh, one of the Finger Lakes. I can't remember which one. Good morning, Stephen. How are you? Good morning, Larry. Thanks for having me. Where, uh, do you live up there? Do you live in... Uh, no, I'm in New York right now, enjoying the good weather you just described. <laughs> oh, oh, nice, nice. So are you retired from uh, teaching? Oh, uh, yeah, I, when I left the principalship, yes, and I've been doing all the things you just listed. <laughs> it tired me out. It tired me out just listening to you. <laughs> oh, really? Well, I'm sorry I took so long. I, yeah, but, but I think... No, you, no, all those things, that's all, that's fine. But was it fun writing about your past this way? Does it, does, did it take you back in time the way I described? Exactly, and nobody's ever said it that way, but you're absolutely right. I relived the 1960s. What happened was, uh, I teach at Hofstra, as you mentioned, and whenever I get to the section about the 1960s and the war in Vietnam in particular, you can hear a pin drop. The students are fascinated, and that's when I got the idea to write this to write this novel. Not, I didn't want to do a textbook. I wanted to do a, uh, I wanted to embed uh, a novel into that history. Do we romanticize the era that the the era of our past? Do we romanticize it? Does it does it does it appear to a young person the same way it appeared to us when we were actually there? Uh, I think they've read and heard so much about it. We, I was talking to somebody about this just yesterday, and they said every decade has its own brand. And the 1960s was very different and very special. You had the war in Vietnam. It wasn't all good. It wasn't all romantic. You had uh, the civil rights movement. Right. And you had the uh, women's lid. And that was a perfect storm of, uh, of change. So it really was a different kind of decade that we lived through. And, again, the students are just fascinated to hear about it. And that was the genesis of the book. What, what, what caused what? Did the music? caused the, the decade or did the decade cause the music? Uh, I play a documentary for the students and and I noticed three levels of music, three faces of music. First, you have the mindless love songs. You mentioned your age there, so uh, you'll probably relate to this a little bit. The mindless love songs that we listened to on the jukebox, yeah. Quarter Plays yeah. Five, you remember that. Right. And then it morphed into the protest movement uh, you would hear uh, in Washington Square, in uh, Greenwich Village. Right. And then it further developed into the hard rock, what I call the Janis Joplin era. So it, I think it came out of the times. I think it resulted from the times. Who are the five freshmen? Five freshmen, and again, these are create. I created these because I did not want a textbook. 
I wanted a novel, and I, I, I love people watching. And uh, when I sat down to tell a story, I said, what would be the frame to embed the history in a novel? And I said, I was a freshman there, and uh, I created... Uh, a composite of four other types, so to speak. Not stereotypes, not stereotypes, but four other types of people who represented uh, what it was like to be going through that. It was, it was, Larry it was very, very different. We started with one Cornell in 1965, 180-degree turn, and came out, all of us, very different. And the novel follows that four-year orientation to graduation. The, was Cornell like Washington Square, just to compare the two areas? Not at all, and that's the difference that I point out, and I mentioned that in one of the early chapters. The other seven sister Ivy League schools are only big cities, New York, Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, Boston. Cornell, and you mentioned that just in the opening, I heard you say that upstate New York, is in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it was, it's a Garden of Eden. It's absolutely a majestic campus, and that's what drew me to it. Uh, again, in the middle of nowhere. And it gave us an insulation at first as students that that we were safe and secure, but bit by bit the war started to creep in. And in the book, a number of events take place. We start off carefree, but uh, pages later we're not so carefree, and it starts to take its toll. Without giving away the storyline, it starts to take its toll on the five freshmen. Are the students who went to Cornell were they was was Cornell at the time um, veered as uh, Berkeley was in California? Not till later. It was one of the latest protests. And again, uh, interesting you mentioned that. We thought we were secure, insulated in a womb. But uh, the big difference was, and I point this out, Cornell's protest moment came uh, a little bit later. But it was different because it was the first time, I believe, that weapons appeared during a building takeover. It didn't happen at Columbia. It didn't happen at Berkeley, but weapons appeared in the takeover of the um, uh, Student Union building on uh, April 19th. And as I mentioned in the book, and this, this was real, because this was a true story, my father was one of those held hostage during the building takeover. <laughs> Talk about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was parents' weekend. And um, they had a few rooms. I'm a procrastinator, <laughs> and I was uh, late in getting a motel room. So I took one of the Spartan rooms, and Spartan's an understatement in terms of a bed, desk, and lamp, uh, in the building. And he was one of the, when the takeover took place, he was one of the people held hostage, briefly, oh. very briefly. Wow. So, yeah. you, 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 kind of, so you wove a lot of these elements into a novel. Yes, yes. And again, so a lot of fiction, mostly fiction, but inspired by some true events. I mean, the event with my, the event with my father is almost comical. If, uh, stop me if I go on too long about this, but I'm a deep sleeper. And at 5 a.m. in the morning, I get a call from my dad. I'm being held hostage, but everything will be okay. Click. I went back to sleep. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, oh, my God. I know. God. I got a lot of kidding. Larry, I got a lot of kidding about this. <laughs> uh, at 8 a.m., the, the, clock, the clock radio went off, and it was Dateline. Maybe it was New York or Ithaca. Students, uh, parents, employees being held hostage, student union building, Ithaca, New York. You never saw anybody jump up as fast as I did. All of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden the phone call. Pants. All of a sudden, <laughs> you, you yeah. remembered the phone call. <laughs> I was lucky I found, any I, found any, I found some clothes under a pile of underwear, which is a natural place for a slob to keep them. And uh, I, was, I was zipping up my pants and putting on my sneakers, and I lived about... 10 or 12 minutes in the Cuga Heights and not, we had a really nice apartment and I broke every speed uh, uh, speeding rule wow. and, and ran every stop sign to get there but you know what Larry and seriously I, 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 in a way I was hoped a policeman would stop me get me there quicker I didn't know what condition I was going to find him in fortunately I did find my dad he was outside of the building by then all by himself oh. I still see him in a tweed coat and a beret shivering it was a cold morning and all he wanted was a cup of coffee and I couldn't go in the building it was just the, st the students had bolted all the doors shut wow that, <laughs> and he asked you that, what took you so long that is <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> you're, you're absolutely yeah where were you where, and he kept asking for that coffee and I don't blame him and I kept asking him what had happened you know, it was like a disjointed conversation because I kept saying what happened and he kept saying I need coffee I'm cold <laughs> we went back and forth my for a few gosh, minutes like that my gosh wow yeah. so how many, that story is there's, real there's no way you could have known that in the future you'd be laughing about this at that, at I, that I, moment I, I was talking to somebody as I say that was the lighter moment it was what ha happened in the days that followed and the last eight chapters of the book without without giving too much away does recount pretty much factually what took place um 
I had good recollection, but I had to resort to a textbook in the Cornell Daily Sun, which was the newspaper, to make sure that I was telling the story correctly, because nobody saw the same thing twice. It was a, a talk about a heated campus. Um, the students were, demand, were making demands, and half of, the, half of the, uh, the world, so to speak, the community, half of the community wanted, uh, wanted the students uh, to be, get, get amnesty because lives were at stake. The first time guns were peering out the window, and the other half said you can't cater to terrorists, you can't give in. Professors were having heated, heated debates on the quadrangle, which, which is right. Don't give in to hooligans. When lives are at stake, you have to. It was a very tense time. So that was a lighter moment, guys. But wow. I have to tell you, it was extremely heated for about five, six days there. Uh, Stephen, uh, no unanimity. There's no agreement. No consensus. Oh my! Stephen, correct my pronunciation of your last name if it's wrong. I'm saying Cusin. Am I right? Ah, uh, uh, it's Cusin. I think I'll t- okay, t- a quick, a quick aside. You'll get a kick out of. I was a uh, substitute writer at one of the radio stations, and one of the anchors couldn't get couldn't get Cusin like the letter Q. So I said, put think of the word Q-tip and put that on your microphone. So during the handoff. Um, Again, she thought she had this down pat, and she introduced me to a couple million people with Stephen Q-tip. <laughs> so I have that tape. Yeah, she got flustered and, and, and oh, no. said Q-tip. So it's, just think of the letter q tip but Steve is fine. Steve uh, is just fine. The book is called Five Freshmen, and uh, we're yes. fascinated so far in, in just the short conversation we've had with Stephen q um, Oh, good, good. <laughs> and so let's take a little break, and we'll be right back uh, to continue. If you're looking at the streaming video, by the way, I do have a copy of the uh, the cover of the book uh, mm-hmm. on the, the streaming video that we're doing. We'll take a little break, tiny break, and we will be right back. This is The Source. The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. A mix of clouds and sunshine Monday, breezy this afternoon. High Monday, 77 to 83 degrees. Monday night, patchy clouds, low 55 to 66. Tuesday, a mix of clouds and sunshine, breezy in the afternoon on Tuesday. High 78 to 83. Wednesday, sunny to partly cloudy and becoming breezy. High 78 to 83 on Wednesday. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm Mike Lucini. Hey, this is Matt Wilkerson from Verizon. You work all day, right? So why would you want to spend your night out shopping for that new phone? Well, Marion County, let me and Verizon help you out. I can deliver to your home or office, saving you precious time. Phone, tablets, internet, home phones, even accessories. Whatever you need, we will deliver free of charge. Call me at the store, 352-528-0020. That's 528-0020. Veterans are the foundation upon which our freedom is built. Listen to The Source, WOCA, each Thursday at 9 a.m. to Veterans News with Hank Whittier from Vets Helping Vets. You'll hear tributes, information on veterans' issues, and stories that will make you laugh, cry, and feel proud. Veterans News always focuses on the military, past and present, and on our first responders. Veterans News is brought to you each week by Bob Wines Camellia Gardens and Nursery, keeping you blooming since 1952. Robin, how do you like my design? You're designing a box? That's not a box. It's a doghouse. Rough draft for your rough rough? Sounds like you need personal service. I do? Yes, to print the blueprints. See Mark at the Personal Service Center. He can print blueprints, notarize permit applications, print and mail out invoices, and even provide great looking business cards. Personal Service Center. That's the one on the corner of Northeast 25th Avenue and 24th Street, right? Just look for the yellow signs. Your pedigree palace will be a reality in no time. All right, 18 minutes after 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Um, our guest is Stephen Cusin. He is up in New York, uh, and he's, his new book is called Five Freshmen, and uh, he's, he's a radio veteran, Robin. He's a reporter for WCBS News Radio 880. That's cool. New York. Are you still on the air, Stephen? Do you still do that? Still with you. Yes? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah, so okay. you, uh, Because I don't have an engineer, it's just me pushing a button. <laughs> So I don't. I don't. It's the same. Same in New York. The the, the, the engineers are. Everybody punches their own buttons. Everybody does that. Oh, good. That's awesome. So, um, what? What's? Uh, this is kind of a dumb question. So forgive me. But what? Like, if this was made into a movie, what song would open up the movie? What? What would be the first audio we hear as the movie is opening? Well, I'm working on the screenplay, and I that I can't. So I can answer that one. Judy Collins singing both sides now. Both sides now. It ca- yes. It, Captures. That's awesome. It, I love the song, but it captures the um, everything about that era. Uh, Joni, both sides now. The both sides now was the Joni, jo- Joni Mitchell right, song, which, right? Joni Mitchell uh, wrote it, and when um, 
when she sings it, it's Judy Collins sings it. Yeah. It just captures the uh, it just captures the mood and it is both sides now because there were two as you said romanticized. But I was t- as I was saying to Robin during the break, <laughs> there was a very threatening side to uh, to life back then. You didn't know when the next court was going to come to get drafted. Right. I was saying to Robin um, during the break that you would be sitting in a lecture class. You know how you always talk before the professor starts. We had large lecture classes. And I would say, matter of factly, where's Larry today? And there would be stone cold silence. You didn't hear? Larry got called by his draft board to go back home. That's how we lived. You didn't know when that mail came, what you were going to find when it's a selective service system in the upper left-hand corner. We it's ha- a scary time too. We have we have a veterans show on Thursdays, and uh, the, your, what you just said right there is what they have told us. In many cases, mm-hmm. the, ve- the veterans who come on that show had that exact experience. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. they were they were called on the draft. I was just a little bit too young for that. I was like the next year. I, I could have been drafted, but that's when the war ended. So I was like right under the wire. I just made it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was another reason I wrote the book, because I lived through all of that. I, I would say that was the scariest night of my life. In the book, I say waiting for my Cornell acceptance was frightening enough. But the night of the draft lottery, it was a death watch. As every number was called, as every date was called, uh, somebody had to be number one. I mean, by the law of average, somebody had to be number one. Right. When they hit 300, when they hit 300... I said, gee, I, I hope my number's called. Maybe I missed it, and I was 319. <laughs> but I tell you, it was, it, Larry, Robin, it was a scary, scary oh, yeah. night, the night of that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I have one brother who joined the Air Force. The other brother waited for the, the draft, and his number was also really high. Uh, so he also wasn't called. Um, the, the one thing about that time period is, I was asking about which affected which, the music or, or the, <laughs> the time, and when you mentioned Joni Mitchell or, and, and uh, Washington Square, I, that's exactly where a lot of that happened. I, I, as, yeah, a, as a yeah. music guy, I know that Joni Mitchell would go to jo- Judy Collins and say, hey, you got the better voice, would you cover this song? <laughs> uh, right. Leonard Cohen was another example of that. Even Bob Dylan does, wasn't always yes. getting uh, deals. So. And and these these were the same people who were writing the things that kind of enlightened the rest of us to know what was really going on. So they were responding. They were responding to the situation. To answer your question, they yeah. were responding to the times. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was his name of the guy who sang about the um, the, the workers? The, the workers, Bob. Oh, I'm drawing a blank. But uh, he drew a huge crowd in um, uh, in 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 Washington Square at one point. There's one scene in the documentary I show. I, I wish this were video, and I show it to my class. And they had uh, they're there with their mouths hanging open. It's one anti-war speaker, not a big name, talking to the entire campus, thousands and thousands and thousands of people about the fact that you don't have your future in your hands anymore. They, the proverbial they do, and talk about one person rallying a crowd. And today's generation, my students just can't can't seem to fathom that. Uh, I shouldn't say can't fathom that, but they're just amazed to see the, the tone well, and the mood of the, of the time. Yeah, because today you can get on your Facebook page and, 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 right. and get a crowd that way. If, uh, it's a different exactly. kind of crowd, but yeah. Uh, yeah you, I discovered that, yeah. You talk about the lifestyle of uh, Miss Abbott and the contrast. Oh, yes. <laughs> Boy, you've done your reading, Robin. <laughs> yeah. but, she, but she was quite a character. She was yes, so and that's German. based on some. But that's a perfect example of, be, of, uh, of based on somebody. I'm a people watcher who wasn't a Cornell, but somebody else who lived that lifestyle and just amazed me. Being so regimented, a diff- doing a different activity every day, life was so simple, and we mocked it then. But as I get older here, there's, it's not so bad. That regimentation, we run, run, run. Everyone's on the run, and you know what? I kind of look back and say that's not a bad lifestyle to have. So as you're writing the book, are you back in time? Are you living that again? And, and oh, they, yeah. Even though you've, yeah. you've uh, fictionalized some of it, uh, or much of it. Uh, oh, much of it. Mm-hmm. You, so you are there. Yes, yes. And uh, I lived every day at Cornell, and as I say, I'm a people watcher, and I watch what happened, and uh, I relived a lot of the moments. Uh, in the book, you probably recall the, the, the joke, and it wasn't a joke, about student deferments ending. And I rem- that's a real event. That wasn't fiction. When the Cornell Sun ran a uh, headline to trick the freshmen, student deferments to end, students to be dra- drafted, yeah, yeah. and then it turned out to be a full weekend prank. A year later, the same headline appeared and was real. I relived that. That one I relived a couple of times when I wrote it because that was a scary, scary moment when we heard about that happening. We didn't think the war would creep into 
upstate New York. Uh, since you present workshops on teen and child suicide prevention, uh, yeah, did yeah. you experience any of your friends committing suicide? Oh, Robin, this is a tough one to talk about. In short, I'll give you the genesis of it and then answer that. I'll make it short. Um, I guess it was 82. My dad died suddenly. He would have given anything. I've told this a million times for more years. 74, he died suddenly, and he had a zest for life. At the same time, a student in uh, the area where I was working, not at my school, didn't like his ranking class, but was in the top ten, took his own life. I couldn't fathom. I couldn't fathom somebody giving up everything when my father would have given everything to live, the juxtaposition. Yeah, right, right. So I asked, so I asked to be trained in suicide prevention, not as a therapist, but as a... Um, as a presenter, and since then, I've, as a volunteer, I've done these workshops on myths and facts, what to look for, the referral process, uh, how to create a climate of caring for different school systems, and I, I love doing it. Yes, to answer your question, uh, in the course of my career, there, I had two students uh, suicide, and uh, again, tough to talk about, and I do with my high school students what I now do with my college students, I have a drop in time. Everyone needs a go-to person, and I feel that if everybody had a drop in time, somebody to turn to before the pressure cooker explodes, we'd reduce the number of suicides drastically. You see I'm having trouble talking about this. Yeah. Um, the number, and I just did a story on CBS on this, just last week, uh, uh, what is it, averages to 124 a day suicide. I couldn't believe it. It's, yeah, yeah, 44,000 a year. Worldwide, I think it's 800. They're all preventable. If somebody intervenes, it's preventable. And it's preventable if we extend that helping hand. One of my students brought in a rock video that I can't play because it's full of um, (laughs) X-rated words. But what a powerful video. And uh, in this video, the person takes his life, and then the funeral is crowded. And I asked my class, what's wrong with this picture? It was silence. I said, where were they when this guy gave the warning signals? They should have been there then, not at the funeral. Mm-hmm. Wow. So I could, go, I could go on and on about yeah. how we could prevent the suicides. It's a very subject about which I'm passionate. That skill set that you, you have from, uh, from being able to talk to people who are uh, on the verge of committing suicide, I'm wondering how different it is when you're speaking to a veteran who has post-traumatic stress disorder from, mm-hmm. from seeing mm-hmm. things in the battlefield yes. as opposed to somebody who's just not doing well in class or who lost a girlfriend or, or something like that. But, Larry, there's a common denominator in both cases. And, again, this is based uh, on experience. I'm not a therapist, and I stress that, but it's from the training. That we interviewed uh, a suicide survivor, and as opposed to a survivor of suicide. Those are two different things. Somebody who's had to watch it. And she said, and I've heard this before, both for your, your, your veteran and for a teenager, you feel like you're in a pit, and you're sinking, and there's nothing to grab onto or hold onto. And that's where the veteran or the student can benefit from a helping hand who reaches out and pulls them back up. Wow. Uh, you, you'll never know how many people you've saved mm-hmm. just, just because of just what you uh, just said right there. Somebody might have heard you just now who, who changed their mind. Yes. Uh, f- five Freshmen is the book, a story of the 60s. Stephen S. Uh, Houston, thank you so much for uh, sharing that with us because I'm reliving a lot of that myself right now uh, just by talking about it. How, thank uh, you. So the book is awesome. How do we get the book? Right, Amazon.com right now. Eventually, it'll be in the bookstores, but right now, it can be found on Amazon.com. So they tell me. <laughs> That's where it is. And did uh, you go through your 60s with long hair? Because now you're No, very I'm short. lucky I had any hair. Robin, you're lucky <laughs> I had any hair. <laughs> I wish I would have I would have looked like Don King if I had uh, let my hair grow. I'm one of those guys. But uh, uh, no, no, not long hair for... Uh, I, I wish I could have grown it that long. <laughs> sore subject, sore subject. <laughs> oh, yeah. do, you, do you think the anti-establishment attitude of the 60s, of the kids of the 60s, um, helped? Helped or hurt that generation? Oh, it helped them. It, l- l- it made them cope with the uh, learn to cope with reality. Again, we were so insulated in 1965 at orientation. Uh, again, if you read those early chapters in the book, which you have, you know, we were afraid to say boo. We were afraid of the proctor. We had we had to have the joke. You read the joke three feet on the floor when the coed was in the room and. Um, I have to watch my language here. <laughs> our attitude was, I don't want to get, yeah. our attitude was, who cares in 1969 when lives were at stake? Yeah. You see, right, that was right, the, right, well, yeah. who cares about three feet on the floor when, you, when your classmates are being 
yanked off campus in yeah. the middle of the semester. Absolutely. That doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you for being on the air with us today. And, thank uh, you. And uh, go get the book. It's uh, called Five Freshmen. Stephen Cusin spells his last name K U S S I N. Thank you, Stephen. We will much be, appreciated. We'll be right back. News Radio, I'm Pat O'Neill. Syria, the focus, as a group of seven officials meet in Italy. Back on Capitol Hill, reaction to U.S. airstrikes last week after Syria.